Once there was an age when thousands around the world flocked to Nickelodeon parlors, theaters, and picture palaces to witness what was to them a new miracle. For this was the time of the birth of the cinema, the motion picture, the very beginning of the first truly mass entertainment industry. beginning, the movies were a kind of people's theater. The um, better off groups just didn't pay much attention to the Nickelodeons, but the, the price was right for the great mass of the working people, so to speak. And so were the stories. For in those early days, the people who made movies were working stiffs just like their audiences putting in 10, 12 hours a day for very low pay. They knew the value of laughter, the one luxury that was within everyone's reach. It had brought the people into the music halls and to the popular newspapers featuring a form of entertainment invented, uh, well, almost simultaneously with the movies, the comic strip. Now it would bring them to the films. There was no language barrier in silent movies, pantomime, slapstick, physical comedy needed no words of explanation. And so the early comedians quickly became internationally recognized stars. But it, um, it's a man who only rarely appeared before the cameras, who is generally acknowledged to be the first genius of screen comedy. That's Max Sennett who once, they say, worked in a boiler factory. Uh, the people who worked with Mac all say that he was not funny himself, but he could, he could recognize with a great booming laugh what was funny. <laughs> he installed railroad waiting room benches in his writer's office so that they, <laughs> they couldn't lie down on the job. Pretty good idea, too. <laughs> he banned books from his lot because, as he said, there are no jokes in books. But he took his cameras out into the street and made funny things happen in very ordinary surroundings. He made heroes out of plain people and showed the so-called rich and respectable, not to mention their defenders, the cops, to be a, a sorry and befuddled lot. Oh, it was lovely. This film, Mabel's dramatic career, has Max Sennett as star as well as director. It gives us a wonderfully vivid idea of what a flea pit movie show was like in the year 1913, with its pianist providing musical accompaniment to the pictures on the screen. Sennett is the roughneck in the audience, and his neighbor is Fatty Arbuckle. Mac is in love with Mabel, who has gone off to Keystone and made good as a movie star. Mac now sees her on the screen for the first time, and when the villain pursues her, he gets mad. Mac Sennett generally gets credit as the father of screen comedy, but he was the first to deny it. It's about time I confess the truth, he said. It was those Frenchmen who invented slapstick, and I just imitated them. The story of the screen comedy began, in fact, in France with a 40-second farce called Watering the Gardener. It was filmed by the brothers Auguste and Louis Lumiere over 80 years ago in the spring of 1895. This was such a success with the audiences of the 90s that 
every other filmmaker rushed to copy it. Now, this version of the garden hose joke was made around 1899 by the Bamforth Company from Yorkshire in England. Filmmakers discovered, in fact, that nothing in the world is as funny as a good drenching. But they had elaborated the joke a good deal by 1906, when a Frenchman, Ferdinand Zecca, made the well-washed house. It's basically still the same joke of a hosepipe and naughty children, only Zecca takes it, well, a good deal farther. Zecca had learned about comedy as a performer in cabarets in the 90s. He went into films as an actor, and he soon became one of the leading directors in the French film industry. As Max Sennett said, give a Frenchman a chance to be funny and he'll go the limit. In 1906, when Zecca made The Well-Washed House, the French cinema was supreme in the world film market, and the major source of its success was comedy. Acrobats, clowns, and tumblers who could fall about all over the screen were of more use to the movies than people who could tell jokes. With Gaumont and Pathé as the dominating giants, all the producers were recruiting talent just as fast as they could, and they sought it in the music hall, the cafe concerts, and the, and the circus, rather than the theater. The movies were able to offer the clowns and acrobats a wonderful new arena to perform in. The very streets of Paris itself, the, the alleys and hills of Montmartre with Sacre Coeur as a backdrop. The clown had never had such luck. No need for painted sets. He could smash up real cafes, fall down real stairs, break real windows, chase down real streets. The chase was the first great craze of moviegoers. In the first decade of the century, there were scores, indeed hundreds, of movie chases. The pumpkin race made in 1907 is one of the classics.
So the acrobats and clowns and trick cyclists and anyone else who could perform or tumble or raise a laugh were recruited to the French film studios in the years around 1910. That year, Louis Feuillade, a director for the Gaumont Studios, spotted an irrepressible little comedian of three and a half years old and launched him under the name of Bebe in a series of comedy films. With his sailor suit, his affected mama, and devoted nanny, Bebe is the typical child of the French bourgeois family of the pre-1914 era. Except that when you look closely, you see that his mama and his nanny are played by men, clowns thinly disguised. Bebe's supporting cast are mostly clowns and acrobats. And clowns and acrobats were the favorite artists of Feuillade's fellow director at the Gaumont Studios, Jean Durand. This is his first star, Kalino, in 1908 as a station master packing a railway carriage. Jean Durand rejoiced in extravagance. No incongruity was too wild for him. In his films, chickens and cows invade railway carriages and horses travel first class. <laughs> Durand's most popular character was Onesime, known in Britain as Simple Simon. Onazim films began in 1910 and exploit the richest vein of comedy, toppling dignity. Onazim blunders with his insuperable, incurable idiocy into the elegant drawing rooms and boudoirs of the bourgeois society of those self-contented days before two world wars had turned society upside down. In Onazim's mother-in-law, a trifling incident with a vase leads to an avalanche of disasters, which incidentally brings mother-in-law face to face with her secret lover.
In Jean Durand's world, people were not the real ladies and gentlemen they seemed, but just reckless troops of acrobats. Durand called his troop Les Puiques. Les Puiques were certainly influenced by Les Pieds Nicolais, a comic strip that was the rage of Paris at this time. His three disreputable heroes also lived in a world of violent hilarity. It was a world where, where there was a whole unsuspecting bourgeoisie just waiting to have its pomp and dignity deflated by his troop of acrobats, Les Puiques. In another of Durand's films, How to Fake a Rembrandt, one of these gullible bourgeois is easy game for a man in a cafe who wants to sell a Rembrandt with its paint still wet. And suddenly, it all came to an end. The French film industry had been supreme for a decade. These French comedies had been exported all over the world. The War of 1914 brought sudden disaster. The industry faded, and with it, all the laughter. Many of the clowns themselves went off to war. For some, like Max Linder, the greatest of all the French clowns, it was an experience from which they would never recover. But Linder's career is another story, except that in America, one of Max's greatest admirers was now about to take the lead, none other than our friend Max Sennett. Here he is in top hat and tails as a comic Frenchman, Monsieur Dupont. The resemblance to Linder is no accident. <laughs> the film is The Curtain Pole directed by the great D.W. Griffith in 1909, when he was the star director at the Biograph Studios. Sennett was an ambitious young actor who persuaded Griffith that they should make French comedies, or so they called them. So this film may be regarded as the first true American slapstick comedy, the saga of a drunken Monsieur Dupont and his curtain pole.
Stewart quickly moved on to direct his own films and then to found his own film company, Keystone. Love, Speed and Thrills, made in 1914, shows the Senate Keystone style already well launched on its reckless road hog way. <laughs> and its eccentric inhabitants, its cars and its crazy cops would become a part of American folklore and eclipse all that had gone before.